slayers gather to cast powerful spells, some of the oldest and most powerful in the history of Magic the Gathering. Spell Stutter Sprite, Ninja of the Deep Hours, Spire Golem, and many others, battling head-to-head -head in brutal combat. They all have one thing in common, to uphold their legacy and the search for eternal glory. The Eternal Glory Podcast is brought to you by the minds behind Bosch and Roll on YouTube, The Raven University, and TheEpicStorm.com. Hello, and welcome to episode 63 of the Eternal Glory Podcast, Popper Format Panel. Uh, before we get started here, um, I just have a quick thing to say. Um, our podcast is currently considering sponsorships, so if you are a card store or other company or you otherwise want uh, to consider purchasing some advertising space on this podcast, feel free to reach out for us uh, to give you a ballpark idea. We probably have about 10,000 listeners per episode, so if you want to reach a whole bunch of magic nerds who enjoy competitive magic, um, consider checking us out. All right, I said some stuff. Someone else do the intro for a change. Oh, I wow. missed you guys. Uh, it's yeah, crazy. It... It's been a whole month. Yeah, it has. Uh, we, we don't miss episodes often, but with the, the holiday season and just the general dregs of legacy, the uh, the monkey menace still on our backs, we just, you know, we took a week off. And uh, I think it was for the best. Uh, when we when we had that conversation a month ago, we were like, uh, let's plan not to do one for the holiday unless they drop a ban list update on us. LOL. <laughs> <laughs> Wishful thinking. Uh... You get coal for Christmas. All right, Brian, how's things on your end? Uh, I've just been working my real job, um, which I, I know that uh, you are going to talk about like the COVID life a little bit. Also, like you're in education. I'm education adjacent these days. I, I provide uh, behavioral therapy, usually in or around a school. And I've been able to uh, conduct about one third of my sessions. So far in the last three weeks, uh, I keep getting emails and calls like morning of like, oh, he's sick, going to be out for the week or someone in the classroom sick. We're going to the school is closed now. I had one call from the the parking lot of an elementary school. I pulled in, turned off my car, was starting to like put my coat on and got a call from the the building administrator who was like, is that you in the parking lot? Don't come in. We just had a confirmed case. Like, OK guess i'll go home so uh that is what i'm dealing with right now but i got my my covid boosty yesterday which uh i'm feeling it a little like i uh, i missed a day of work when i got my first vaccine uh just achy and cold i don't feel sick uh, i'm not like vomiting no no fever or anything but i am very achy and spent the day in this chair that i'm recording the podcast from which means it's lucky that all my students this week canceled their sessions or else i would have had to uh i get to save my pto time because it's their fault not mine but i definitely would have called off today if there was anywhere to be it's a weird world i can't go into you know too many specifics because some of the things i know aren't entirely uh public and whatnot uh but i'm probably having six kids on average out per class during the day right now and there's enough faculty out that like teachers are being asked to cover others teachers classes because we can't find enough subs uh situation's bad in my school um we've had to send a bunch of kids home it's uh it's real bad for morale like no one said out loud like we're going to think about going full remote or we're going to close the school for a little while but it's 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 probably there below the surface somewhere pittsburgh is in the whack-a-mole situation where they are closing down any building that they can't have enough healthy teachers to staff it like on a daily basis. It's like per day, somewhere between 15 and 30 schools are closed. And it's like you could have to show up to school on Tuesday, but not Monday. And then you're closed again Wednesday. And it's not like nobody wants to pull the trigger on like we got to go remote for a while. It, it really is just like the full whack-a-mole. In non-depressing news. um. I, I tried DMing, um, that is like being the dungeon master for a game of D&D &D, uh, for the first time over break. Um, that was fun and refreshing and only a little complicated. 
um that was that was nice i got to give my normal dm a break and actually get a chance to be a player for a change um so it was nice to watch them get up to some shenanigans while they got to actually relax and just like have a beer while we played for a change when i was reading the show notes phil i read that and i was like phil's never direct message before uh just because that's what came to mind first yeah. Hey there, babe. How you doing? I'm a big content creator. Uh, yeah, I got that message from Phil. I was very confused. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's in the uh, sexy Eternal Glory uh, podcast chat. Yeah, the NSF NSFW uh, version, Patreon only, <laughs> where it's the same podcast, but Phil has his shirt off. It's a good shirt. It's a Death and Taxes shirt right now. I I actually had to turn down a a D and D game. My former GM invited me to join a new game that he's joining where uh, the GM is Ruben Bresler of former Magic Coverage, who has been like a official sponsored WOTC like live stream DM, like uh, like a mini critical role. I, I don't know if people have kept up with him since he left the Magic Sphere, but he's actually like a person of note in the D&D world. Like to the point that if you type in like Ruben gifts uh, in like the Discord gift generator, you'll get actual pictures of Ruben, and uh, like it, it's like a thing. Like and that would have been like really exciting to be part of. I just don't have time, so unfortunate. But that would have been a great time to kick up my my D and D experience. All right, Bryant, uh, how's things on your end? Things are going very well for me recently. So to humble brag just a little bit, I'm sure. A decade ago, you'll remember the world was supposed to end in 2012, and I graduated from college in 2011 and thought, well, at least if the world ends, I won't have to pay back my student loans. Well, right before the new year rang in, I paid them off, uh, and it feels like such a burden taken off my shoulders. It's just like I was literally paying 775 per month for an entire decade that now I just get to, you know, put in the bank account or buy Japanese foils with. I won't tell you which, but... It will be one of those. It will be both. It's the same thing. <laughs> True. Congratulations. That's a, a big deal. I, I am officially on the uh, government forgiveness in another 11 years or until we get a president that cares about the working class at all. That, that's my gamble. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm I'm pretty. I've paid off all my private stuff at this point, I believe. Um, I've got some public stuff that'll be forgiven after 10 years of teaching. Which is like soonish. Honestly, I don't know how long I've been teaching for. It's all blurred together over the last however many years this COVID shit has been going on for. Did I tell this story about my public service loan forgiveness snafu uh, on the podcast? I don't want to tell it again if I did, but uh, be- stop me if I've told the story. But I I feel like I've heard this, but I don't know if it was on cast. I'll short version it. Okay. I thought this past November, November twenty twenty one, was going to be my 10 years in public service. I've been working in special ed approved private schools since November of 2011, and I've made qualifying payments throughout. But the entire time I was an income-based repayment. And for a large amount of that time, my income was such that it was not fair for the government to ask any money of me. (laughs) I was making like 20 grand and change for my first couple of years out of college. Uh, It was a rough run. Uh, So the government just didn't take any money. And then I went back for my master's and They put me on auto deferment because I was in school uh, without like, it wasn't a conversation I had. They were just like, oh, you're in school. You don't have to pay now. We're going to defer your loans despite my loan payment already being $0. So I spent a year and a half just in my brain, like making $0 payments, but actually I was not making payments. So it's actually like another year and a half on top of past November. And that's why I switched careers in October. I was like, I could have dragged this out for two more months to get my loans forgiven, but I'm not doing it another two years. Like time to go make some money. I tried. I really did. Well, you seem to be liking your new job more. So I think it's a win. Uh, Yes, definitely. Uh, The the quality of life and the ability to work on content and all of that. I, I don't wake up at 515 in the morning every day. Life is good. So to circle back to just before New Year's, the way that my wife's family does everything is for Christmas, they order Chinese food. 
And I love that as a tradition. Uh, we are not Jewish, but it's very popular among Jewish people in the United States. And her family's just always done it. And when I started dating her, I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. I love Chinese food. So for New Year's this year, we were like, why don't we get Indian? And we just ended up binging the entire fourth season of Cobra Kai while stuffing our faces full of Indian food. And honestly, it might be the best New Year's I've ever had. Like, I had so much fun. It was just like healthy, enjoyable. Like, it was a blast. Love Cobra that Kai. That sounds amazing. I also binged Cobra Kai and Queer Eye and... And Dexter New Blood and uh, the first season of Billions. I'm working through Succession. I've spent a lot of time watching TV over the past since the last time we talked. So uh, I wasn't planning on getting into this, but I also watched all of Dexter. Did you finish it? Yes. So at the throughout the season, I was like, you know, this isn't bad. I'm enjoying it. And then at the end of se- episode nine, I was like, oh my god, it's finally gotten good. This is going to be amazing. And then at the end of episode 10, I felt the same emptiness that I felt at the end of the original end of Dexter, where I was just like, I can't believe they did that to me. I am going to just take the spoiler free response to that and say, I like how it ended. Okay. It hurt. Yeah, It's impossible to have this conversation without ruining it for the people who still intend to watch it. So let's just move on. But I did enjoy that. And we can talk about it off the air if you want to. All right. Thank you very much to Henrik Korkutz for going and donating to keep our podcast going and uh, keeping our editor nice and happy so he removes all of the stupid stuff that we say. Uh, Thank you at Force of Phil, Phil Blackman. I had a shower thought the other day, just like the phrase don't feed Phil popped into my head, which is like a shirt that Bam Margera used to sell about like his like big fat dad. And we say all the time, like we need to keep force of Phil fed. And I don't know, maybe we need to bring back those shirts and uh, Phil can do some pro bono work while we wear those shirts. Can we bring back the skateboarding too? just like snap back to like 1998, some Tony Hawk pro skater action, banger of a soundtrack. Is that the memory you associate with the with Bam Margera? And don't feed Phil in that whole era. Oh, I think about like the Tony Hawk. They're like, yeah, yep. absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because that's Bam's brother in that band. Uh, they they played in State College when I was in college. And I went and Phil and April were there. The the Merge era parents. Bam was not, though, because they, they're based in Philly. So th- that's all local to me for the most part. Relative to the earth, it's all very close. See, I told you Pennsylvania is just two tiny cities that are right next to each other, and you tried to tell me it wasn't, Brian. You're like, uh, Pittsburgh's yeah, yeah. so far away, and now you're just agreeing. Right. I mean, relative to uh, our, our listeners in Germany, I certainly live very close to Philadelphia. <laughs> relative to uh, playing F&M in Philly, it, it's impossible. Can't be done. Might as well be Madagascar. I don't know. Can't be done. All right. As far as like, our magic stuff's going probably unsurprisingly from like the title and the fact that we're going to talk about popper today um brian and i have both in particularly been playing uh, a lot of popper right now it's just like all over our donation queues um i've tried brewing some decks myself at this point i'm really experimenting with the format and enjoying it um it has a few uh, format health issues that we'll maybe touch on a little bit later Uh, But it's very strategic, a good blend of like limited skills and constructed skills. Um, I've been enjoying the hell out of it. Um, I also went up to uh, five days a a week content for a little while here. I don't think I can keep it up, like given how tiring work is right now. But like I had a lot of time over the holiday to record. And so January is a treat where there's uh, a lot of bonus fill content. Nice. Were you at four or three? at I was at four. Okay. I I can do four comfortably like working a full-time job and playing D&D and all the like normal social stuff that I want to do. Five is the point where it starts to get hard. If it's all like combo and prison leagues, like I can, I can fly through those. But every time someone's like, Hey, play my Yori and death and taxes list. I just like look at my watch and go like, all right, is it three or four hours this time? Yeah. I, I had that experience a couple weeks ago where, or maybe it was last week recently where I, I wanted to do something quick. Uh, I had like exactly two hours to get a video in and I looked at my queue and like the next decks in a row were like Dark Bant, Yorian Bant, Shark Still, another Yorian Bant. And I was just like, oh my God, uh, Popper Fairies, like that, that deck is very slow as well. It just, it, it was a grind. I ended up reaching like two weeks into the future and just recording some World Gorger Dragon League. I find it funny that for for you guys, two hours is a short league where I'm like, two hours is a really long time. Oh uh, my god. <laughs> yeah, uh, the the Epic Storm, the the combo channel on the on the group here, definitely. Yeah, when I record a league, I recorded uh, Vintage uh, Holovine today, and even having to spend 
eight minutes in the queue between every match. It was still like a one hour experience. That was really nice. One thing that I found about Popper is that when I go to share my videos, I do get a lot of people that just comment with, I hate combo uh, more than any other form that I share to. But I also get probably just as many people that are like, I don't like combo, but I love your channel. Like keep up the good work, which is always just really interesting because combo is a super unrepre- underrepresented archetype in the format. I know we're still in the updates, but yeah, I mean, we we can talk about that when we get into it. But they've done a good job of banning every combo. Uh, there there are like strong late game synergies that start to look like combos once you're you're doing things. But uh, is yeah. a tog a combo? It is. Yeah, we'll we'll come back to you, boy. Yeah, we have words about Atog. Uh, Richard Shea, we're mad at you. Come get your son. <laughs> yeah, so uh, in the Magic world, like Phil said, uh, I have been playing a lot of Legacy more than either of you guys, but I, I ha- have also had a steady drip of Popper. Uh, I actually told people I wasn't recording Popper for a while when I really needed to get my donation queue. In a, in a row, I was only taking Modern Vintage Legacy for a while, but I've re- opened it back up to Popper and I have like one a week for the last three or four weeks, and then there's one a week in the in the pipeline moving forward for a little while. Pretty excited to have access to that format again. It's been a hot run of Bosch and Roll Classics on my channel lately. Uh, I had this awesome challenge from a generous patron of the arts who helps my channel a lot, who gave me three chances to trophy with Bant, and if I could do it, I would get $500. So those videos are up. I'm not going to spoil them, but uh, I, I got a lot of feedback that that was the best content I've ever put out. Just that that run of trying to trophy a league, playing my best, uh, tweaking the deck in between each league and like really, really, really caring, which I normally don't in leagues. But uh, that was an awesome piece of content that I got to do. I revisited Shark Still. I revisited Teferi Vacation, which is the first video I ever released that hit 20k views. It was uh, it's still in my top five a year later, and the re-release is outperforming the original. So, uh, really exciting run of of bangers on my channel lately. I think you're just gonna have to make Teferi Vacation an annual thing. Like every year, you just go on vacation. <laughs> well, the 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 person who originally submitted it, his name is or his username is Akia, and. He has a lot of some of the best, like the best brews that have shown up, the most exciting videos. Like he has that, he's in that sweet spot of is a casual, but also knows how to slide casual things into Legacy World where it's not just like, I'm going to go 05. Like I'm pretty sure he was behind Crow Storm. Storm is also also like Storm Crow Storm uh, in Legacy and he's had some good ones. Uh, he's also the reason I got into CEDH. Uh, he donated for me to play Mono White Teshar on the channel, and the rest is history. Now I'm just in that community somehow. Oh, thanks for, for that support, Akia. Um, I have a really exciting event coming up. Uh, we, we've been nicknaming it Draft Hala, where these these guys in a town like an hour or so outside of Pittsburgh, uh, they're friends of friends and they run a big limited event every year and the prizes are always like dual lands or power. And like, they're just like people with money who live in the woods and like playing magic, but only casually, but uh, they're all like limited experts and they extended the invitation this year to a wider friend group. And this weekend I will be drafting adventure of the forgotten realms, Innistrad werewolves, Innistrad vampires in three drafts like three separate draft pods on day one day two is uh cons block and then uh zendikar rising nope not zendikar rising oath of the gate watch the the middle of zendikar set and then cut to a top eight rise of the eldrazi draft first place is a candelabra second is a gaia's cradle and like it's all reserve list down the way uh it's it's just this insane like 32 person secret tournament in the woods and I'm very excited. I've been listening to a lot of Lords of Limited and Limited Resources in preparation this week. Hell yeah. I'm so excited for you. Yeah, yeah. that sounds awesome. Yeah. I don't play much Limited. Uh, it's actually shocking when I do draft these days how rusty I've gotten. Just Limited Fundamentals have left my body because I, if I'm playing Magic, I'm recording for the channel <laughs> and Legacy is the opposite of Limited. It is almost unlimited. But uh, speaking of Legacy... 
Titan Games is having a legacy event, and then the Buffalo Chicken Dip Legacy Tournament is at the end of January. I will be attending both of those as long as it is safe and healthy to do so. So you mentioned CEDH. I've dipped my toes in. Uh, I recorded a league with Alex McKinley, Drake Sasser, and Andre Sagara. Shout out to the three of you. And it was awesome. The community was really welcoming. They were happy to, you know, share my video and whatnot. I'll be honest. The results of the video weren't that great. Uh, but a lot of it was, we're not really interested in watching Magic Online gameplay. I've played a bunch of cues of Commander in my free time, just like for fun. And I've grown to actually really like the interface. I know that I'm like uh, in the minority here, but it's awesome. Uh, and I love playing online. So, I mean, eventually I'll do the, the webcam stuff once I have my deck finished. But in the meantime, I really like it. Yeah, the webcam stuff is a lot of fun, and I don't mind Magic Online interface either, uh, but I play it a lot. Uh, it is horrible if, like, two people in your pod don't play a lot of Moto, and then they just, like, click through their turn once, and then the whole game is fucked. Like, uh, that is rough, but but yeah, I, I used to queue into Commander queues just, like, while I was watching TV, too, just on the, on the down low. And uh, it's made mail every day fun because like when I started building my deck, I was at 77 cards that I already owned out of the 100. So like every other day or so, I just get a new card in the mail for the deck. And as of right now, I'm like 10 cards short of just having it all. Um, so it's kind of exciting. So maybe you'll see my deck on webcam soon. Nice. That's so much fun. Like I, I spent a large period of quarantine building one commander deck, then another, then another. I built three commander decks in the last year and a half. And the steady stream of packages from DCG Player and eBay and whoever the hell like you order them from Facebook Marketplace. Just my girlfriend, uh, she'll like bring in the mail, and it's just like a pile of packages the size of her head, and she's like, "Ah, uh, you have some mail." So like, I wasn't yes. going to get into this, but I guess I'll share it. Uh, like three months ago, I needed to order top loaders for shipping out for the Epic Storm. And I noticed that they were triple the price from the previous time that I purchased them. And I was like, that's kind of wild. Uh, and I was like across the board to Amazon. And I was like, maybe they just went up in value. I don't know. But recently when I'm getting orders, they're not in top loaders. People are making makeshift top loaders, like including stores. I'm getting like little cardboard folded things and everything else. Uh, it's actually rare that I get a top loader on my orders at this point. Yeah, any like professional outfit I order cards from it is off top loaders. They they just became scarce. I don't know if it's like the trade war with China or just COVID shipping interruptions or both or what. But yeah, top loaders. It's been a thing. Like I I'm friends with a bunch of vendors who have mentioned it. But yeah, it is fun seeing those like little folded pieces of cardboard with someone's brand on it. Uh, Tales of Adventure has like an actual like medieval wax stamp that they like melt wax and <laughs> print a stamp. Like okay, I, I love getting mail from them. That's, yeah. cool. oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Good stuff. And if you want to check out uh Japanese foils, I uploaded a bunch of them to my YouTube channel. I did t uh, 10 weekdays. So 10 videos all together of different decks that I own Japanese foiled and signed. And I'll be completely honest. Doing that destroyed my algorithm. Uh, I went from being projected at quite a bit of money, and I'm like $250 less now because it disrupted my algorithm so much. Uh, I was getting like, on average, 3,000 views per upload in the first like few days. And those videos got like, including the regular videos I was uploading at the time, like 500, 600 views. And they're still at that. Like the YouTube algorithm just doesn't like it when you double upload. So I'm just never doing it again, ever. I also got punished. I uploaded a tutoring session on Friday, and I cannot emphasize enough how much of an analytics disaster it was. It was, like, so bad that it was, like, a video that I had posted, like, a year and a half or two years ago in terms of, like, the slide back on the progress. I saw the the professor, the Tolarian Community College professor, melting down on Twitter the other day. Apparently, he uploaded a video incorrectly or like missed something in editing and had to pull it and re-upload it which is just analytics no guaranteed nosedive just nuclear bomb if you pull a video and re-upload re it yep uh like changing your thumbnail and stuff uh that's that's part of the algorithm game but yeah he had a multi-thread all caps full of profanity thread <laughs> about uh how stupid he feels and how deadly the algorithm is if you if you break its precious rules yeah, so I definitely did that. Ugh. 
yeah, I'm going to be recovering from that for like the next two weeks. And I have another tutoring session at some point that I think has to be like a YouTube members only video at this point, just because it's so bad for my analytics. Like, I don't want to go too deep into inside baseball, but like if you're trying to optimize your channel and like grow and do the things that are best for the channel, you can't just like post the things that you necessarily want to all the time. Womp womp. I had to make a, a really like robust post to my community because uh, I posted a, a league that was like, you know, 5-0 undefeated with mono blue artifacts and people like some number of people were like, I hate when you spoil it in the title. And I'm, and I had to like explain how you might not like it, but you're here commenting anyway. And like 200 random people browsing only clicked on it because it said undefeated. And like, I'm going to grow the channel first. And there were some wild suggestions in the comments. Like most people were like, you do you, or they confirmed like, yeah, I only watch undefeated videos actually. And, but like a couple people like really dug in and they were like, why don't you post it without the spoiler for 12 hours and let us enjoy it. And then repost the video with a different title later that day. I'm just like, holy shit. Yeah, that no, <laughs> <laughs> just no. So the uh, circle back to this a little bit. I got a couple comments that were, Brian, you haven't uploaded the Epic Storm in almost two months. What's the deal? And the deal is, honestly, I haven't been playing a whole lot of Legacy. And when I have, it's been super fun deck. So you might have seen I've uploaded Hyper Genesis earlier this week. And that video is doing super well because it's a blast and it's a silly deck. But when I'm playing to win, I want to play the Epic Storm. And while it's not that the Epic Storm is not good, it's just that I'm not enjoying playing it right now. Like, it's just not fun playing against, you know, the Ragavan Menace of the format and everything else. So instead, I'm just not playing Legacy Challenges, which is what I would upload the Epic Storm with. Uh, this is the longest drought that I've ever gone without playing in a Legacy Challenge since they've been created. And I kind of miss playing them, but at the same time, uh, I feel like playing them tells Wizards that you're okay with what's happening. Like, I was a little bummed to find out that last week's hit 100 people. Uh, so maybe I'm just in the wrong here. Uh, but yeah. All right. Um, shall we go ahead and get into the meat of potatoes of it with Popper? Let's do it. Let's okay. go. Go ahead. All right. Um, we start. Phil gave a little uh, love letter to Popper in his intro today, but I have long held the opinion that Popper has a good argument for the best constructed format. And by best, I just mean like uh, gameplay, decision making, uh, all of the things in involved in what makes the constructed format good. Uh, like Popper has so much of it. Uh, I I have been known to call it legacy without the bullshit. So like you still get brainstorm, ponder. Uh, you can play combo. You can play aggro, mid range, tempo decks. Like whatever, they're all there. But there is no chalice of the void. There's no show and tell. There's no a row like it, everyone's going to get to execute their game plan and the game will go some medium to large number of turns and allow for many decisions to be made and there are no decks in the format uh th there's no thorn of amethyst you know like uh, there, there's no chalice of like y you will get to play your game and i think that leads to the better player or the player who played or built better for their expected metagame or played better in this match will win a larger amount of the time than in any other constructed format. It's extremely skill testing in ways that other formats often aren't skill testing. There's an insane, absolutely insane amount of like combat math and, and trading and resource management decisions. And I found the sideboarding is incredibly difficult in the format because you have a lot of times a bunch of medium quality sideboard cards and a bunch of medium quality cards in your deck and figuring out like how do I configure those to approach and how does that change versus play draw how does this affect my mulligan decisions uh th there's so much going on you know do I use my prismatic strands to protect from this lightning bolt type card early on or do I need to save it in order to uh protect from a sweeper you know, how much damage am I willing to take from this creature in order to save a removal spell to play around like an Atog finishing me off or something like that? The depth of decisions is huge, and more so than any other format I record, I find myself saying, like, I don't know quite what the play is here. 
I have two points I'd like to make. So probably a year ago at this point, we said, hey, if you want to get better at combat math, play limited. And that still remains true. That said, that same philosophy could be applied to Pauper if you're not interested in Limited. Playing enough Pauper will get you better at playing Limited. It doesn't even matter if you're playing a mid-range deck, an aggro deck, or even combo. Combo decks definitely use the attack step in this format. So if you're looking to up your fundamentals of magic, Pauper is a great way of doing it. And, and the second point I wanted to make here is typically when you're building a sideboard, at least for most constructed formats... You don't want to be making marginal upgrades. You want to be taking out cards for hammers in any specific matchup or significant upgrades for the most part. But because of the power level of Pauper, you don't always get huge upgrades. So sometimes you are making a lot of slight adjustments. You're taking out a card that's still probably fine for a card that's slightly better. That happens more often than not in this format. Brian, that is a really good way to put that. And part of the reason why I've had so much trouble sideboarding with Pauper like, sometimes it's really easy. Like, okay, I'm playing Affinity. I bring in the Dust to Dust and the Gorilla Shaman. But then you have, like, oh, I have this Ramosian Rally, which can give all my creatures plus one, plus one. How badly do you want that effect? And frequently, uh, like, in the Is It Fairies versus Affinity matchup, for example, which is something I've played a lot of, the Is It sideboard is, like, four Pyroblast, three Hydroblast, two Dispel, and then some other stuff. And uh, Hydroblast counters or kills Atog or Fling, no questions asked. Dispel can hit Fling or Deadly Dispute or one of their Hydro Pyroblast or Dispels, but it can't hit the Atog itself. And then Pyroblast can fight the Thought Cast, or you can win a Counter War over Metallic Dispute, but it can't interact with their actual beaters at all. And just like, you have to figure out, like, uh, Am I going Arnold Palmer here of just like one of each or uh, is Dispel and Hydroblast what I want and I just have to let them resolve Thoughtcast if that's going to happen and Pyroblast doesn't have enough utility and you just really have to split the difference of many similar effects that all do a little bit but none of them do all of it. And like you said, uh, a lot of the times I find myself like boarding out Counterspell, like actual blue blue Counterspell for Dispel just uh, on tempo in like a matchup where... Uh, anything I need to counter is going to be an instant and you can't counter ninjutsu anyway. So like having a, this two mana thing and like a fairy's mirror is clunky and you don't want it. And there's just a lot of stuff that isn't clear on the surface and still isn't clear once you're dug in either. This is going to sound silly, but I think the blast effects are one of the more powerful effects in the format. If you look at it as a format whole, like the big draw to playing red in the format outside of the burn deck is Pyroblast. If you look at all the red decks, they definitely have it. Most of the blue decks have Hydroblast. The, those effects are just super popular. And I think when you play them in a, a format like Legacy, you take them for granted a little bit uh, because you're just like, yeah, they've always been there. But when you switch it down, you realize how important they are. Uh, I will both add to and counter that point by saying that the blasts, when they're relevant, are some of the most powerful things in Legacy, too. And being a blue wizard, most of the time, it is never lost on me how fucked up Pyroblast is, where, like, uh, you you can't maneuver to the spot where, haha, back to basics resolves. They just untap their, their one basic and zap it with Reb anyway, and uh, just... Even if you resolve your Jace, you masterfully resolve your Jace, like they can just rip Pyroblast at any point and clear the your four drop for one mana. Like it is not lost on me on how powerful that is in Legacy. And but the thing you said about the format scaling down where people are playing these hyper efficient, like built in the bathroom at pre-release level limited decks, Pyroblast is extra fucked up in there. So um, if you end up wanting to get into Popper, I really encourage you to take some time, sit down, write yourself out a sideboard guide against, you know, the five or ten most common decks you think you're going to see, and really try to figure out your plan ahead of time. Because I have absolutely used all three minutes of sideboarding uh, during some of these Popper videos as I just, like, try to figure out what my approach is going to be, like, both playing the deck for the first time and often encountering my opponent's deck for the first time. Um, you know, if you want to get competitive fast, you know, once you have a few leagues under your belt, uh, consider doing that if you found the deck for you in Pauper. I know that I've mentioned this on a previous episode, but the format itself 
is underexplored in my opinion. Like there's just a lot of ground that hasn't been covered yet, especially for a lot of the non-popular archetypes. Like you're probably not going to make that many improvements to the deck Tron. Like you might find a secret card or something that improves it, but you're not going to revitalize the deck. But for example, if you wanted to work on Pauper Infect, there's probably a lot that you could do there because there's less people working on it. And even a second person working on that archetype could do a lot of damage because there's very few people working on it. So there's some stuff that you can do, but there's definitely something for everyone. And I just want to like circle back to that. Decks like Bogles have a lot of players, but like, Maybe you like Bogles and Modern and that deck fell out of favor. So this could be the format for you to play it in again. A lot of those decks that you fell in love with in 2014 and 2015 are now super viable in this format. Yeah, like the Is It Cyclops, Kiln Fiend type decks are still around in a couple of different flavors. There's a mono red version. There's the the Is It version as well. Um, if you want to get like value via Mold Drifter and Flicker effects, that sort of stuff is out there. There's a couple of different Monarch-based decks, some Ninja-based decks. Um, really, the range of decks is huge. I've, I've played a few tribal decks like Elves and Slivers. I made some absolutely disgusting screenshots with the Elves deck. Um, I think I sent my opponent to like negative 370 life on like turn four or something like that. Uh, you, can, you can do some really silly things in this format when things go well. Yeah, and to add on to your point about uh, porting your your favorite deck from formats past, if you look at competitive formats uh, like Modern and Beyond, you might be surprised how many of the cards that you're playing in Modern are commons and just float down to Popper. Uh, like, Maldrifter Ephemerate is a thing in Modern. Uh, the Ephemerate Flicker decks, like, you don't get Yorion in Popper, that's a rare, but Ghostly Flicker, Ephemerate, there's all of the evoke elementals worth playing like the, those are all right here in popper um there's a jeskai mid-range deck that uses cleansing wildfire on your own lands which is a thing that is happening in modern too like uh, the there are control de decks that play flagstones of trocare so you can ramp and draw a card it's like ramping growth in your jeskai control deck there's a jeskai uh, like the the new cycle of indestructible etb tapped artifact lands artifact dual lands from modern horizons 2 you can target them ramp yourself and draw a card into your control deck or you can fight tron it's just like there there's this clever stuff that's happening in modern that is porting directly to popper and vice versa a lot of these powerful engines are were originally designed as things you could do in limited which means they're common which means they're going to show up uh bogles was mentioned already Almost every card in that deck's a common. Uh, you don't get Daybreak Coronet, but uh, Slippery Bogle and Glaive Cover Scout, uh, Rancor, like Ethereal Armadillo Armor, like Cloak. Dillo Cloak, my god, that card's unbeatable. Yeah, it, it's crazy how many of these things are commons. And uh, like, like uh, Bryant's here, he can vouch uh, also commons throughout History of Magic. Uh, Rite of Flame, Dark Ritual, Cabal Ritual, Lotus Petal. Like there are some messed up commons throughout magic's history. So I have two points I'd like to make real quick. So I'm glad that you mentioned the wildfire ramp decks, Brian, how often on Twitter do you see people going like, I'd love to go back to see dry now once a day. Like it's, it's often. I tend to mute those people, but yes, it, it is like a, it's a thing I'm aware of. Those people, if they played Popper, there's literally a deck that does that. There's a creature that when it enters play, if you have Metalcraft, it drains your opponent for four. It's almost the size of a Sea Dry. No, it's a 4-4. Four, four. So you get to play this Jund mid-range deck with Gav Blast and that. And that's exactly the type of magic that those people want to be playing. But they're just not playing this format that allows them to do that sweet thing. And speaking yep. of doing sweet things combo decks in this format, it's super hard to win. And honestly, I feel like that's one of the strengths of the format and i'm someone that really likes to deck build and figure out pieces of the puzzle pun intended and you know really hone my craft like i like figuring out all the possible things and in pauper the combo decks are sort of watered down because they removed all the good win conditions so before this podcast went live i was talking with phil about galvanic relay before the Chatterstorm ban, everyone's like, ban Relay 2, F Storm, that card doesn't deserve to exist. And I was like, well, have you tried it without Chatterstorm? Because it's actually really difficult to win. So when you look at it now, 
Brian, people are literally playing two mana ping creatures to win the game with Galvanic Relay. They're just like, yeah, I'm going to cast 20 st- spells after I play this pinger. And that's what's happening now because the win conditions are so tough to win with. So there's a lot of hoops you have to jump through, but honestly, that's part of the challenge and why I love this format. And those two mana pinging creatures are also in the core of the burn deck, which provides another data point to call Storm Haymaker Burn in all formats. <laughs> also, the burn deck is super scary. Like, Oh yeah, it, it's the police. Like, Make no mistake, burn is good. Uh, I... I mentioned all the cards that you play with in other formats that are commons, like how about Chain Lightning, Lava Spike, Fire Lightning Blast, Bolt, Fire Blast, <laughs> Searing Blaze, Rift Bolt, Skewer the Critics. These are all commons. And uh, the best deck in the format is an artifact deck. You know what you get to play in the sideboard? Smash. Smash to smithereens. That's yep. right. So it's even got insane sideboard options. I have a spoiler for the two of you. I recorded Cycle Storm this weekend and I uploaded it and I was like, you know what? I'm going to go Pure Grixis this weekend. No green. Who needs Gnaw to the Bone? Guess who lost their winning into Burn because they didn't have Gnaw to the Bone? Uh, get wrecked. You got boned. I'll, I'll, I'll spoiler as well. I recorded um, Abzan Soul Sisters in Pauper. Went 4-1. Guess what? I, guess what the life gain deck lost to? Oh, God. It was womp, right here. Womp. I, Did you get murdered? I was amazed. I was so amazed when it happened. Like one of those, like absolutely just not bad, like not mad, but I got obliterated before I like could get stuff going. Yeah, like it doesn't might not make sense in the brain of someone who hasn't actually seen the play pattern, but Thermo Alchemist and the uh, the two one Archer that has a similar effect whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, ping your opponent. Those are pretty close to like Goblin Guide and Idol under the Great Rebel. Those are. It just, like, adds plus one to any spell you're casting. Repeatable thing, like, the Philosophy of Fire, uh, the Adrian Sullivan version, not the design philosophy, It is like, you're supposed to be able to look at your burn opponent's hand and just multiply that by three and generally be able to pace out the game. Like, I'm at 12, and they have three cards in their hand. Like, I'm safe right now. Like, those are the sort of calculations that you can make against burn. But Thermo Alchemist, it's just, like, uh, surprise nerd and then like uh needle drop is in this deck like they ping you with uh thermo alchemist needle drop you get another damage draw a card ping you again and that cast that burn spell like this is i mean burn is a combo deck in all formats but it especially feels like one sometimes in popper while we're on the subject of burn i'm sh- sure that i've mentioned this previously but spoiler seasons become extra more fun when you play popper because every card that's spoiled goes into something because you know there's what hundreds of comments printed in the big sets nowadays so you end up like scouring through these spoilers for stuff so for cycle storm for example repository scab a glorified archaeomancer ended up making the cut for cycle storm and at first i read it and i was like i don't think this is very good let's go on to the next card but when you look at the burn deck well darren epicure when it comes into play you make a blood token and you get to ping your opponent for one for a one drop that also has one power so you're getting essentially you know two damage for this one card because it's probably going to hit and you get a looting later so you get a lot of like weird cards out of new sets too so just another great reason yeah i love spoiler season especially for master sets and uh like horizon sets and like all the the like big crazy stuff because that's an opportunity for them to downshift cards like rarity shift uh there's a number of cards that were originally printed at rare that are popper staples like elvish vanguard uh one in a green one one when an elf comes into play it gets a plus one counter that was a rare and onslaught block it was a common a few years later in some corset or something and mortician beetle is another yep yeah there's a few like that and uh the pirate classum uh fiery cannonade uh fuck that card oh my god (laughs) (laughs) that card has killed me from so many like i can't possibly lose scenarios yeah it was that was a like finger on the monkey paw curls moment for me because I spent like a decade saying I want pyroclasm in popper because is it fairies? We had to play swirling sandstorm. That's a four mana spell that has no text until you have threshold. And then once you have threshold, it deals five to all non flyers. So like uh, that, that's not a good card, but it was the best we had. And I was like, please, can we just have pyroclasm? And then they printed a pyroclasm. That's an instant which means it can sweep up an army of fairies in the end step or in response to a spell stutter trigger, 
Like, I mean, Fairies is playing that card, but it also gets blown out by that card. And I, I think they made a good choice of putting that at common instead of actual Pyroclasm. Uh, the other one that has gotten me a lot is the, what is it, Karak Clan Shaman. Oh, yeah. That, that, card, that, is, one is that card is gross. Ancient technology. That's a, a one red, one one. You can sack an artifact to deal one to all creatures. So, like, it kills itself as soon as its first trigger resolves, but you hold priority and just sack whatever you need to to sweep the board. So, for those of you out there that might be fans of other goblins, like Kirk Clan Shaman, there's a deck called Mogwarts, a pun off Harry Potter if you're a fan of the series, but it is a goblin combo deck. So, if you have an affinity for food chain goblins, this deck looks to go infinite with first day of class. Puts a 1-1 counter on a creature when it enters the battlefield for the end of the turn. Use that with a sacrifice outlet like Skirk Prospector plus Putrid Goblin to make infinite red mana. And from there, the world's your oyster. I've played a lot of this deck. It turned threes a reasonable amount of the time. That said, it has the classic problem that a lot of uh, combo decks have in this format where you lose the graveyard hate and you lose the removal. So... There's a lot of like crazy stuff you can do here, but Popper has a lot of back and forth. So a lot of the combo decks in this format have weaknesses that can be um, targeted with. And that's one of the big things is a lot of people talk about like there's not a lot of interaction in this format for a combo. But all of the combo decks usually involve creatures in one way or another. So your creature removal will even be live there. Yeah, that that statement is just like patently false. Like uh Every almost every combo deck needs some sort of creature in play, whether it's the Thermo Alchemist or Mnemonic Wall or uh, Skirk Prospector. Like every combo deck in this format can be broken up by Lightning Bolt or Red Blast or uh, or whatever. Like it, uh, Cast Down is a really popular. That was also shifted down from Uncommon recently. That was a big upgrade to the format. Double Masters. Like, yeah, like that. and a Braid recently sh- shifted down from Uncommon to Common. Like. Uh, Removal is very good in this format. Interaction is very good in this format. And uh, if you get dumpstered on turn three by a combo deck, it's probably because, A, you're either up to no good yourself. Like, your deck is also a linear thing. Like, if Bogles gets dumpstered by combo, I don't feel bad because you're also trying to cheese. Uh, You've chosen to play a deck without interaction in hopes that you don't have to interact. Like, that's just a strategic decision. That's not a judgment on Bogles players. That's literally your game plan. But, uh... It, there's a lot of moments where, like, when you're playing against Affinity, uh, we've we've sort of danced around this for a while, but Affinity is the best deck in the format, and uh, it gets Thought Cast and Deadly Dispute, so it has basically eight ways to draw two cards for one mana, and then it has Mirror Enforcer and Disciple of the Vault that can pressure you for damage, and then it usually plays, like, one or two flings to go with the Atog. So you need to respect their free 4-4s four and their incidental damage off Disciple of the Vault, while also knowing that at any point if you tap out, you could get flung and just die from basically any life total. So, like, if you get comboed out, there's a good chance that you could have played around it. And, I, like, I think Affinity is a little over the line because they're so good at pressuring you on board that it's not really fair. They get a combo just also chilling. Uh, I, I would like that deck to be the first hit by the the new popper band panel or whatever it's called that we're going to talk about in a minute. But uh, like, if you're just going to die to a fling, then you can't cast that end step. Whatever, like you got to leave open your one mana for dispel or hydro blast. Like, uh, it, it's just like fundamental magic of knowing what can beat me here and playing around it at all times. And affinity's a really aggressive example but most of the combo decks apply to that so affinity has these splinter twin thing going on where like brian described i'm not going to reiterate everything but you have to respect one thing and then you die to the other but affinity is even slightly worse right now because you like brian mentioned you have thought cast and uh what is it called deadly dispute Uh, dispute. deadly dispute so you're always gaining card advantage while you're doing it for very little cost because both of those cards essentially cost one mana which is just nuts and Another card that you may not have read during spoiler season, but it's from Crimson Vow, Wedding Invitation, makes Atog unblockable. Like, that's just another way you can get murdered by Atog. It's just insane. Yeah, let me read this card for for the listener, because the first time I saw it cast, I basically, I I felt my heart sink into my butt. Uh, (laughs) It's a a two-mana artifact. 
ETB draw a card. So it's a cantrip. It's free. And then zero mana, just tap sack this. Target creature can't be blocked this turn. If it's a vampire, it gains life link. This is just fling. It's another fling. It's a cantripping fling that feeds your thought cast. And if you're not in a place to make an ATOG unblockable, you can sack it to Deadly Dispute and just draw more cards. So the other axis of this deck that we haven't mentioned yet is just Disciple of the Vault, uh, which is uh, probably very familiar to our uh, older players out there who uh, have encountered Affinity in one or more formats. But these these decks are very good at sacrificing artifacts, not even just counting when you have a TOGS. You know, there are treasure tokens, there are blood tokens, uh, there's things like your chromatic stars that are going to go to the graveyard naturally. Um, I had a chance to kill a Disciple, and I had lethal on board next turn, and I went, you know, I'm at 19 life, I think I'm good. I sure as hell died just to a Disciple of the Vault and a bunch of just naturally sacrificed artifacts that turn. Yeah, uh, Chromatic Star and Chromatic Sphere are both in the format. Icker Wellspring is in the format. Prophetic Prism. Uh, Blood Fountain. This is a hot one. I have also died to this one recently. One black artifact. When it comes into the battlefield, you get a blood token, which are artifacts. So it's two artifacts for one mana for starters. This is just Dark Ritual in an affinity deck. And then the blood token is a loot when you need action. And then the ability of Blood Fountain is three and a black, sack this, return two target creature cards from your graveyard to your hand. So good job. You fought through the first ATOG. You countered one of them. You you killed another. And then they're back. <laughs> it's so hard to beat the first four. And now they have like eight of them. And it's crazy. Yeah, that that deck can can grind so well. Um, but something I want to like really make clear here is like affinity is is definitely problematic in the format but the format is still incredibly fun to play um even the affinity matches a lot of times like even if the affinity deck is favored they're usually still real games and you mentioned it earlier the the sideboard options are potent there's gorilla shaman dust to dust smash to smithereens like there is stuff to do against a deck that wants to put a lot of artifacts into play there's also the Hydroblast card. Some of the decks um, in some of the more competitive events, so like less so in leagues, but more so in challenges, uh, some of the decks like Boros Bully, which is a uh, red-white control deck that has a lot of graveyard-based value, some of those decks are starting to play dust to dust in the main deck to just exile two artifacts with one card. And if it's not good, they just use Faithless Looting. And uh, what's the red-white looting card? Discard two, draw three. Uh, I know what you mean. I don't know the name. Yeah, Yeah, I don't know it. Uh, You just use your looting cards to bin them when they are dead, when you don't play against Affinity uh, in your game one scenarios. And and that sort of thing is usually like the sign of like some format health issues. Uh, But there's there's an incoming solution to that at some point. Thrilling discovery. Thank you. Yes. Get your get your sacred cats on. Are we ready to talk about the panel? Yeah, Was that your segue, Phil? Yeah, I, I think that's the segue. So we got an, an article slash video drop a couple days ago by the time this podcast goes live uh, announcing a popper format panel. And essentially, there's a panel of was it was it seven? It's seven, including Gavin, seven, including right. Gavin uh, individuals who are going to serve as advisors to Watsi for what to do with popper. Essentially, Watsi has kind of too much on their plate right now. Uh, for some of these niche formats like Popper, they maybe don't have enough eyes on the format to really know what to do. And so they've selected a pretty good set of, of people uh, from multiple countries, multiple viewpoints, in order to kind of have an advisory board for what to do about this format. And something we mentioned above was that uh, Popper has been very slow to take on new changes. And this is hopefully something that is going to work towards remedying that yeah this is a conversation we've had on this podcast about legacy uh, countless times where uh, someone presents the opinion of they don't care about legacy it's like they might they just don't have the bandwidth to do anything about it they're designing new limited sets they're designing new commander precons they're managing the fucked up standard format they're tweaking cards for alchemy on arena like and then we're we're so far removed from the eye in these uh, niche eternal formats that I mean they've said straight up we don't design for legacy we, we don't we don't even try to test because we can't 
and that's not a new thing. But it is new that they're bringing on a group of civilians to have actual direct line of uh, conversation with the people making the band decisions. The commander format has the uh, commander advisory guild. Is, I, I forget what the G is. It, it's called CAG. Uh, commander advisory group, I think. <laughs> it's probably more normal than guild. Uh, There's but... two of them. There's the commander advisory group and then the commander's rules committee. Oh, yeah. The the rules committee are like Sheldon and Toby and level five judges and uh, Scott Larrabee and like people who are actually making decisions about how commander works and managing the ban list. And then the commander advisory group is a pretty large group of people who play the format in different ways and have they're usually like social media influencers or uh, large content creators. And they're in touch with the people on the ground that the rules committee might not run into in their normal travels and that is a really cool idea i think it has been i guess i don't know if it's been good for commander i i just don't know if it i don't play enough of that format to know uh have a timeline of like if they changed anything but this is the first sanctioned format where civilians are on the panel uh, in this sort of formalized way it's also interesting because typically not to knock commander here but Commander doesn't have a, a gateway to the Pro Tour or the mocks where Pauper does, which means that these people have direct influence to, you know, some real power. Yeah. Um, and kind of the, the vibe that I've gotten from this announcement and kind of the things that I've seen as as follow up is the the panel here does not directly make the changes themselves. They are like the advisory board. People at WotC kind of make the final call. But it seems like they're probably going to go with the the wishes of the panel in a lot of cases, unless they have like significant reason not to. Um, and it's nice to have like community members doing this rather than some randos. Yeah, the when when I watched the video, I was like, who'd they get on this? Like Alex Allman retweeted it. Alex is a, a friend of mine. Uh, we've collaborated on content. I was reading. Alex Allman weekly religiously on Channel Fireball before any of you ever heard of me. Like uh, he he is a stalwart, a uh, very prolific writer and advocate for the pauper format. Like I would have started the panel with him and then asked for his recommendations to fill it in, and it wouldn't surprise me if that's what happened. But I don't actually know that backstory. But yeah, Alex Allman, Paige Smith, also huge pauper contributor member of the community. Alex and Paige ran the pauper Premier League together. Uh, they produced it. I was a member of that when it ran. Emma Partlow played in that. I think all have all three of those people done intros for the Eternal Glory. We'll we'll check our notes, and if not, guess yeah, who's getting not, a DM? Uh, right. Yeah. Like I feel like all three of these people are friends. I know Emma's done it. It, it seems likely that the other two have been asked, and then uh, they went into Italy, Japan, and Brazil for that international opinion, and that's really phenomenal. All of these people are just really great choices. So this is slightly off topic, but growing up, I always heard of an Alex Weber that was originally from Syracuse that moved to like Arizona that was supposed to be this legendary player. Like growing up, I heard about this person. They were larger than life. So I start playing Pauper and I see an Alexandre Weber and I'm like, is it the same person? Is it the same person? And just it's not. But uh, great name. Yeah. Brazil has a phenomenal Pauper community. Uh, I, I've gotten to work with a couple of their people. I've not worked with Alexander directly, but Brazil is is a hot spot for Popper. Yeah, multiple deck lists that I've like researched have come from Brazil, and I think I even like found some like articles and resources that were in English from Brazil as well. Very nice. All right, we ready to jump into the contentious section then? Let's do it. All right, the legacy format panel. It took all of like. Three minutes after this popper format panel video went live for legacy twitter to lose its goddamn mind and yeah. the explosions of tweets of various varieties that followed uh it, it was insane yeah i i want to be very gentle in this section because there's not really honestly much to discuss but obviously people saw like a fringe eternal format that has been wallowing in a, a band drought for a long time, and clearly Watsi doesn't have the bandwidth to deal with it, get a community panel that's official. 
Legacy is also in Eternal format. Most and not quite as niche as Popper, but also really niche. And it's been wallowing in a band drought for a long time, and Watsi doesn't seem to have the bandwidth to do anything about it. And obviously the parallels are clear. A lot of people are like, okay, great, now do Vintage and Legacy. And it, a number of people stepped up and volunteered, like, I'll do it, pick me. And a bunch of people just started tweeting, like, uh, I, vo- I volunteer the following people. This is my dream panel. and. I got tagged in a few of those. Uh, I I know uh, I was tagged with Phil in one of them, I think, and uh, other people, uh, other names flying around. And I think we should chill <laughs> and <laughs> see how this goes in Popper. And like the idea of nominating your panel before it's even been announced that this is going to be a thing or any intention to ever be a thing. Like I, I think we need to take a deep breath, though. I understand the excitement about the possibility of something like this. I think we also glossed over a potential negative, which is, hypothetically, let's say your favorite card in Popper gets the axe. It's removed from the format. It is banned. There's now someone that you can directly blame for that decision. Whether or not it's true, they could have voted against it. You don't know that, but now there's someone that you can directly point your finger at. And I feel like that is a cost a lot of people aren't considering right now because there's still people out there that scream from the rooftops, unbanned Sunsi's top. Deathrite Shaman should never have been banned. And that's an opinion you're, you're allowed to have. Perhaps you're even right. But now you get to point your finger and say, Brian Koval made that happen. I effing hate Brian Koval. And I don't know if that's the greatest thing. Yeah, I, uh, I, like I said, I've known Alex for a long time and, uh, I'm not going to get too personal, but he has suffered an outrageous amount of abuse, and there's no other word for it, from the Popper and especially the Popper subreddit communities, just for having opinions with no power all these years. He just has a platform, he shares data, he shares his opinions based on the data, and people are like, you know, fuck Alex Allman. Does Alex even play Popper? Uh, that that was a running joke between him and I for a while. Like we'd be brewing a deck list together in in a group text, and he'll say something, and I'll, I would reply like, "Do you even play Popper?" Uh, and uh, like that was a running joke, but it came from a hurtful place, and that's just from someone sharing their opinion. The fact that like if Alex's unpopular opinion on Reddit from his article three years ago suddenly becomes true, the these like horrible people just being miserable on the internet now actually have some sort of direct line to say like you did this and that's pretty fucked up uh like every one of these people is extremely brave for taking this on because it's going to be thankless and it's going to cause a lot of problems for them like whatever comes out on the other side there's going to be someone who's like i just foiled out my atogs or like whatever and is going to be real mad about it and uh power to them i i hope they are all in a good place and protected by Watsi to, yeah, to weather that storm. Maybe less so on like some of our channels because like we, we very much are like fostering communities and like regulating the things that are happening. But I'm sure uh, for those of you that watch streams, you've been in streams plenty of times. There's a lot of toxic stuff that's that's flung around, um, frequently towards female players, for example. Uh, now imagine that you have a female player who is in charge of your ban list decisions. How much is that going to amplify the the, the shit that is thrown at them? I, I don't envy these these people. Like they've they've taken on a a decent burden because they have a love for this format, and I absolutely respect them for for doing so. Absolutely. When I saw the legacy community starting to circulate, like. I'd like to do it. Like I have thoughts about this, like, I, or like people tagging the people they want. Like my first thought was don't put that anywhere near me. <laughs> I, I don't want it. Take it away. It, it's just, you know, people are going to be awful. And I don't know that I have the, the bandwidth to take on the emotional baggage of all the Reddit users who should be in therapy, but instead are on Reddit and just unloading on whoever they can like that. That just, it sounds really awful. Note to self, make sure to post this episode to the Legacy subreddit. I mean, it's automatic engagement right there. I think that enough of the Legacy Redditors know who the problems are and who are not. Uh, it, it, I mean, I, I don't go in there. I don't, I don't give a shit. But like, <laughs> uh, yeah, Bryant was just pointing to himself. Uh, but 
I mean, there's like normal people in any space, even a space that is like overwhelmingly shitty. There are normal people in there who can sniff out who's shitty and who's normal and like whatever. But uh, there and not just Reddit, but like Facebook groups. Uh, I'm going to side tangent here. We haven't done much of that tonight. And this episode's pretty short. So I'm going to indulge a side tangent. I joined a Magic the Gathering Facebook group. Just Magic the Gathering. No, no, like legacy. No, no, nothing specific. Simply magic and i did so because uh emma skayward uh what posted that she had started this thing and she was fostering content creators and there was like a hundred thousand members and they had no rules against promoting content and i was like okay that could be useful to me and the posts that come out of that group just melt my brain and not in a way that is uh disparaging to the people making the post but it's just like I joined that group so I could post like legacy shark still or whatever. And these people are like, does anyone know of any angels? (laughs) It's like, oh, is is that the whole question? Uh, Like, like what angels are there? I I have these three. Are there more? And like, they don't know about Scryfall. They don't know. The uh, Gatherer even. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it's very humbling to see the gap between how I interact with magic and how a person like that interacts with magic and uh again not disparaging i have the deepest respect for everyone and how they engage with the game that's the beauty of it you can do whatever you want but i have not posted any content in that group after seeing who's actually posting in there it's it's too far gone or or not far enough along i don't know it's just and, and like if that's the type of person like who just like doesn't know either way and they have this platform and like, I'm sure if pauper bans happen and like the articles, like thanks to the contributions of the pauper ban panel, we've come to the following conclusions. You know, someone terrible is going to be in that group, even if 99 out of 100 are just like wonderful magic players learning the ropes. There's going to be some dickwad who's just like has a dickwad opinion and they're everywhere and they suck. I have a question. So for how long that the three of us have been podcasting together? I believe we've gone through four band cycles. Would you agree with that? It sounds about right. I won't argue with you. There is a specific Reddit user that I'm not going to name, but for every single time that we've ever discussed something involving bands, they've singled me out and they go, Bryant thinks this should be banned while he's out there with Veil of Summer? And just, like, makes personal attacks on me. Meanwhile, the blue tempo deck that gets knocked down every six months, uh, this person's defending that and they make personal attacks at me and I don't really care. I do find their posts kind of funny. Like I screenshot them so I can laugh at them later, but it's weird that they've singled in on me as like the enemy. I don't even have any power. Also people already hate me. So I'm never going to be nominated to this group, (laughs) but like I wouldn't want it because like if this clowns are going after me, what about people that actually care about the format that want to see change? Uh, and that I don't pick the card that they think should happen. Like, it's going to be brutal. I think trying to actually make decisions about the legacy format via a panel would also be so incredibly difficult to do. Uh, I, I don't want to name names here, but if you scroll legacy Twitter, you are going to see vastly different opinions about what needs to change in legacy. Uh, like to the point where you would wonder if two like legacy specialists who only play legacy like they have such wildly divergent ideas like you would wonder if they were playing the same format that's how crazy different these takes are um the if a legacy panel were to be formed i think they would have a herculean task in front of them to actually correctly identify what are the biggest problem cards how many things need to go how many things do we ban at a time it's not an easy task yeah, I took place or took part of Joe Dyer's end of year round table. Uh, did you guys do that? Um, I did. I, I didn't do this one. I did a previous okay. one. Yeah. Yeah. Brian, you did, right? Correct. OK. Yeah. So one of the questions was like, what would you change about legacy? And I offered the opinion that I have offered on this podcast multiple times, which is like I would hit Ragavan and Expressive Iteration because that's Deathrite Shaman and Dig Through Time, but only one deck gets to use them. And Then I extrapolated this like sort of stream of consciousness thought thing where I was like, well, uh, maybe like if we take days out, 
then if combo gets too good, ban Grizzlebrand and Thassa's Oracle. Like, there's still combo, but, like, not stuff that can really punish a format without days anymore. And, like, uh, like th- things just change. And uh, I didn't, like, say a lot. It was just sort of like this, you know, cascading. I brought up the uh, the standard bans when they banned uh, the energy cards in... Kaladesh standard they banned uh the the three two that gets two energy and draws a card and a tune with aether the the lay of the land that gives you two energy and then just out of nowhere they also banned rampaging ferocidon in the same ban list update <laughs> because they had correctly identified that with energy neutered mono red would be oppressive and nobody was even talking about mono red because it was kept in check by energy but watsi had the foresight to be like you know what uh this card is the most oppressive card in the soon to be oppressive mono red deck. Let's just hit that while we're at it. And I th- I was really impressed with that man choice. And I still am today. And uh, I was just sort of, you know, like snowballing, like, you know, what is, are like the next order consequences of banning something like days? Like, I don't think you can just rip days out of legacy and things would be okay, but I wouldn't mind seeing four cards go to, to get rid of days once and for all. Like if that is what happens or, you know, or just take the pressure off with Ragavan and EI. I, I don't care. Like, I offer both things. And I avoid Reddit, as I've said, but I I was, like, screenshotted some takes that were pretty aggressive, uh, that, like, that's the worst idea I've ever heard. He just wants mid-range mirrors everywhere, all the time. Like, there's there will be no, no fireworks, nothing interesting in the format, just endurances smashing into each other. It's like, yeah, okay, that's that's definitely what I said. But like, and that's just in like some article that I don't even know how many people actually read and, but actually impacting a sanctioned format for which Grand Prix and PTQs are held. That's big. I think a lot of people always assume that there's personal gain trying to be had, which isn't the case at all. Like when Brian and I write that stuff, we're trying to genuinely solve a problem. But when people read it, they're called Brian just wants Royal of Flame to be the best card in Legacy. When that's not really the case at all. And since you mentioned that article, Brian, at the end of or the last question is like, what are the changes you would like to see uh, regarding legacy? But it wasn't the ban question. It was the last one. And what I said was I would like additional transparency, maybe go back to quarterly announcements. Even if you're not going to ban anything, give us the state of the format. And I think something that should be done, and I mentioned this in the article, is the way that Amazon works is they'll push a change for 10 minutes to an hour on the website, gather a bunch of data, undo the change. And then decided that's something that they would like to permanently do. Amazon is a living, breathing website that is always adjusting to optimize itself to be better for the consumer. And Magic Online has thousands of users that can provide them data that they just don't use. So, for example, if they decided to push, you know, a a format that is legacy adjacent without days, they could have 20,000 matches in a week. And gather that data, see what it looks like, and then make an educated decision. They don't do this stuff. This is something they could do. They could have these test periods. They did it with the London Mulligan. They could do it with format changes. They don't. But I think that's an interesting space that they could try to occupy. I'm not sure how successful it would be, but it's an option. I mean, they're already doing that on Arena. Uh, they, The historic ban list had a watch list. Like cards that aren't banned yet, but we're trying the format without them for a while before they ended up on the ban list. They invented alchemy, uh, which obviously you can't like decide days you have to pick up two islands or whatever. Like that's not how you actually fix a, a printed magic card. So alchemy doesn't work. But the idea of alchemy of like, let's try a Seekers chariot that only makes one cat token and see how that plays out for a couple weeks and, and we can fiddle with it as we want to. Like they are aware of these things they can do because we see them doing it on arena instead of magic online this is also something that we could see coming in magic online's not too distant future um i don't know the logistics of this exactly but um magic online is being handed over to a new company for like further development right there was an announcement about that not too long ago i forgot about that that's so exciting like that's that sort of crossover, like once things are stable with that and everything's handed over, like they absolutely have room to explore those sorts of things if they have more resources being put towards Magic Online as a platform moving forward. They were 
putting out job listings. I happened to browse them because I was curious and I'm interested to see how much like the current magic online that it actually is because some of the job listings were like looking for animator for uh, like fire animations or whatever. I'm like, so we're going to have fire animations in this thing. How closely to arena will it be? Um, these are just some of the questions that I'm interested in seeing. I'm sure they don't even have designs yet. It's so early in the process, but I don't know. I'm excited to see the future. But I enjoy my boomer client that looks uh, like it came from 2002. I imagine they would give the option to turn off the animations because Arena also does that. But the fact that they're planning on designing a client that could support additional animations other than just like the swirl of like a summoning sick <laughs> creature or like the soft glisten of a foil card, both of which I have turned off, by the way. Uh, but Magic Online, like it struggles to load a game like I, I don't know about you guys, but my laptop, which is less than two years old designed for gaming and i don't do anything else on it it's not lagged down by much it like whirs and hisses and like like as <laughs> as my as we go to sideboarding and like it, yeah throw some fire animations in that pile of shit like, I, I am excited for the implications of fire animations I am a little disappointed to hear that from you, Brian, because, you know, one of my favorite moment, all time moments of this podcast is you doing the Oko animation or I'm sorry, the Uro animation. Right. And I'm not going to get more of that. And it kind of breaks my heart. I mean, I'll try it for a while. Like I haven't played Hearthstone basically since Storybrooke Brawl came out. But for a while I was in on Hearthstone and all of their every card in Hearthstone has like a enters the battlefield emote uh, like like a thing it says and then one when it attacks and one when it dies and it's a thing in the hearthstone community to just like shout those emotes at each other it's just like a meme uh like reno jackson was uh, a card that if your deck is singleton when you play reno you go back to your starting life total and when he comes into play he yells we're all gonna be rich and like there there's just there was this like apple tree that like uh when it died, it did something. And when you played it, it would say rotten to my core. <laughs> and it's just like, I, I, I always played with the sound on for like the first week of a new set. And then I was like, okay, I know these now I can get back to business and turn them off. And I would definitely like love to hear the, the bubbling when Thassa's Oracle goes on the stack or, uh, what sound does endurance make? I'm excited to know. Uh, maybe we get the Oro animation in magic online. I would not turn that off. Yeah, I'm, Get ready I'm very for slurping. familiar with the, the sounds that some of these cards would make because I'm just like so used to making them myself. Uh, so, for example, whenever my opponent uh, plays Plague Engineer, it's just like, oh, fuck. Or yeah, equivalent. I <laughs> in, in a recent video that came out, somebody uh, linked the timestamp and they were like, I want someone to talk to me the way that Brian talks to Uro. <laughs> like, I, I was like, <laughs> my opponent was like, it, it was like, the stabilizing point of Bant versus Is It Delver, where like they were down to like one Dragon's Rage channeler and and Hellbent, and I had like a land in my hand, and I was like, "Come on, I need a good card!" Like in the next three turns, and I drew Uro immediately, and I I said something funny. It was like it was like, "Oh hey baby," or like you come here often. I just like said something really sultry to Uro, and somebody commented on that, and they're like, uh. Why doesn't anyone talk to me like that? And I was like, well, are you dummy thick and bring pizza and beer to every party? Because <laughs> Uro is. Yeah. Uh, once or twice a week, I will get just a timestamp of like some ridiculous sh shit I said in passing while recording videos when I have one of those moments. And because it's usually two or three weeks since the time that I recorded, I'm reliving the things that I said, not remembering what they were. It's a good time. I did enjoy watching uh, someone made a collection of Brian's uh, oh, favorite yeah. <laughs> moments. I watched like half of that. It was like a 30 minute long video. And I watched probably 15 minutes of Brian just saying ridiculous things. Yeah. Uh, shout out to uh, Dalton. Uh, that's who made that. He, he is a uber regular comments on all my videos and stuff. Uh, he was, I think, the first person to buy a wash and roll shirt and send me a picture of him wearing it. So shout out to him. And yeah. Uh, Today's video, it, it was my Shark Still video, and I played against the Minotaur deck in it. And at, at some point, I like stuck a standstill, not realizing what they were doing yet. 
And then they played Urza Saga, and like three turns later, they had a didgeridoo in play, and I still had standstill, and I was like, okay, how bad is this going to get? <laughs> and they they like didgeridooed in the the tribute minotaur that's like you can give it plus two plus two forever or you can let your opponent cast an instant or sorcery for free and i was like i have standstill i'm not paying that tribute and they cast the like seven or nine mana like red 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 three spell that's like two or four minotaurs and yeet them into play and uh, like uh somebody linked me to the sound i made it was the sound of my soul leaving my body as i like wheezed out the text of that card <laughs> and, yeah i i love those moments uh I, I was completely out of my rocker during that match. Uh, I made as many didgeridoo puns as you can. Like, uh, we didgeridid it when I won, and oh no, you didgeridon't when I like prismatic ending their thing, or like. Yeah, didgeridoo <laughs> or didgeridon't, there is no didgeridoo try. Yes, that's a good one. They didgeridoo tried and they didgeridoo lost. <laughs> so, to bring it back to topic for just a second, we can leave topic Boring. after. Boring. is one fear because i mentioned on twitter that i'm skeptical of the pauper format panel for legacy and that remains true not that i don't think a collection of legacy players couldn't do a better job than the people not paying legacy paying any attention to legacy at all and i think that's the big argument for it is that wizards for the most part doesn't have someone looking and 10 people that are invested into the format can likely do a better job i'm willing to concede that point my fear is that these collection of 10 people try to undo stuff and by then i mean there's 10 to 15 cards that most legacy players and i say most because not all most legacy players go this should have never been printed i would not want their thought process to be it is my job to correct that because it's not your job to unprint cards it is your job to fix what exists and that's just my biggest overall fear i don't want them going down a list of 12 cards going well, Plague Engineer shouldn't have been printed. Veil Summer shouldn't have been printed. Prismatic Ending shouldn't have been printed. Like, once the cat's out of the bag, it's out of the bag. Your job is to just try to shift the boat back to where it's going, I guess. Maybe I could have had a better uh, expression there or whatever, but I don't want that to happen. Yeah, and luckily for now, we don't have to worry about that because there is no legacy panel, and this is all hopeful speculation on social media. But, uh, yeah, um, I get heated comments anytime i play with or against urza saga where people are like this is a mistake it's the most broken thing i think urza saga is a phenomenal magic card like i think so it is I. appropriate in power level i think it creates really interesting deck building and there are things that can challenge it like uh dress down or like pernicious deed like justin canari won a vintage btq with pernicious deed in his deck because of how it lines up against urza saga like it does a unique thing that pushes you in a direction that is punishable. And I got a comment on my my five O with uh eight cast where someone was like, On in match three, you could have cast Thought Monitor for one blue, like a one blue flying two two draw two, and you decided to play Urza Saga instead. What does that say about that card? And I was like, It says that a pair of ten tens does more damage than a two two over the next three turns. Like what do you what do you want from me here? Like <laughs> I could cast Thought Monitor next turn. Or is the saga takes time to cook? I, I and there are some really hot takes and and we are we're starting to get down that that road too. Like if I were hypothetically on this hypothetical panel, I would be the one in the meeting, like, no, that card is interesting, leave it alone. Frankly, I feel the same about Uro. Uh like we 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 went through that when we talked about uh, when Dread Horde Arcanist Oko and like astrolabe and uro were were being talked about for banning i still think uro is an appropriate power level card for legacy yep and uh i know some people don't feel like that and as like a bant guy like the bant guy like oh, fucking obviously i think uro is like it's a card i like it's a card i play but i also think it's appropriate um uh, i don't always just play the thing that's broken because i win with it or else i would be an is it delver guy and i'm a bant guy instead uh i i've made this choice i play decks that i like and I don't know. I'm getting down a side tangent on a hypothetical thing about a fake thing that's also hypothetical. So I'm just going to come out of it and zip my face. Want to know what I hate about Urza Saga, Brian? What's that? That the day that I could officially buy them, they were $40 for Japanese foils. And I said, for a rare? No way. That card's only a rare. It will be 20 bucks in a week. Well, Oops. after that one week, 
Uh, it was a modern all star. They went up to sixty bucks, and I go, that will never last. You know what I shame bought at? Uh, ninety. One twenty each. Oof. Oof. And uh, I don't think that card's ever leaving modern. It is the perfect power level. It's the perfect power level for legacy. I was wrong, and guess what? Sometimes your opinions are wrong. And that's another fear that I have for these format panels. But thankfully, we don't have to worry about it. Yeah, I had the same thought about Urza Saga. Like, the first thing I recorded after MH2 was Vile Affinity featuring Urza Saga and Thought Monitor. And uh, I also recorded the, the like, week one Asmaran Food Saga deck. And during both of those leagues, I was like, oh, this is so busted. It's not going to last. But it was only busted because people hadn't figured out what else they could do with Modern Horizons 2 yet. It was week one. People were still playing, like, Jund or whatever the hell people played in Modern pre-MH2. It was a paradigm shift, and I pushed into the Breach before they did. And now the Breach has enveloped the whole format, and everyone's evoking Solitudes and shit. And it's really, it's a different format than it was pre-MH2, and so is Legacy. But I am not upset about that. So something I think would be really hard about like having a panel to manage the ban list is you have very different crowds to cater to. Um, let me use Sensei's Divining Top as an example here. All right. So in like very competitive play, Miracles was uh, like very insane, right? Just incredibly consistent. Top also has like some time, like tournament time concerns. And a, a ban is understandable from that standpoint. And then you have that guy who plays Painter at his shop every week who's real sad because they can't weld that top in and out of play anymore. Or you have the Nick fit player who loses out on their colorless selection in their non blue deck. So I think legacy Twitter legacy, like legacy Reddit and groups like that uh, would be very quick to focus on like the highest levels of competitive competitive play, because that's where a lot of legacy players are at if you're in those places. But legacy for many people is hey, here's this deck that I love that was like an old standard or modern deck that I can't play anymore. I want to show up to my shop once a month when we have a legacy night and jam some games. And I don't want to keep losing to this new Ragavan card every week. It's just utterly uh, just obliterating me. Like there are different groups of legacy players out there. And like the number of casual vid videos on like my channel and Brian's channel are just a great view of like the range of, of legacy. A lot of people just want to do stupid shit with a smokestack. <laughs> yeah, smokestack. Smokestack is what should be what legacy should be about. Bring it back. Ban Bring everything back until smokestack is the best deck. Then ban smokestack. You heard it here first. I thought that was supposed to be Kurt Ape. Whatever. Uh, I think Kurt Ape's too far gone. Sorry, buddy. Yeah. Do we have anything left to say on any of these topics? Ban legacy. Ban legacy. Ban ban legacy sounds good. Yeah, so I, I encourage you to think about whether or not a legacy format panel is something that you actually want for legacy, because I think hearing the popper format panel announcement can like give you this like FOMO sort of feeling where you're like, where's our legacy one? I don't want to miss out on having a legacy panel like this. We can have legacy changes if this happens. But could you put together a group of seven people that you think could like perfectly fix legacy? consistently for years to come whatever that means i don't think i could pick the seven people to do that given how entrenched i am in the format because i think a lot of people either don't have a full view of legacy in one way or another or they might not be the best communicators or like they might have other interests at hand i like there's there's a lot of issues that you would have in selecting this this panel so you know food for thought. Yep, keep those fingers on the monkey paw straight. 